Continuing on with chapter 2, chapter 2, no, this is chapter 6, page 155. So this is the section, second lecture for chapter 6 for AP Environmental Science. You can see a picture here of a caterpillar, and this is an example of herbivory, again, where animals um, eat plants, called herbivory, with an H. Page 155 uh, uh, discusses uh, coevolution, and um, this is the term that describes interacting species that evolve together. For example, um, I'll take this off. If this plant starts to develop uh, a toxin to protect itself um, and, and starts to ad adapt to protect itself from being eaten from this caterpillar, then this caterpillar will also have to um, evolve, so to speak, and that is some members of the population developing a mutation that would have it um, tolerate the toxin in the plant and the ones that could tolerate the toxin would survive and the ones that couldn't would die out and the ones that could tolerate the toxin would then spread on that um, mutation to their offspring and that's really what natural selection is. Um, and so we call this process coevolution. Evolutionary arms race is a term we refer to when one species develops um, new good traits um, that would be an S, new good traits. So its predator or prey must also change and become better and stronger and faster. Symbiosis is a physically close relationship. The examples we have are parasitism that we talked about in the first video lecture on the previous page. Mutualism is when both species benefit. For example, bees and flowers both benefit through the process of pollination. Bees get uh, nectar, which they turn into honey. Flowers get pollinated. Microbes and your gut. So inside your stomach and intestines, you have bacteria that help digest your food. You need them. They're important. That's why we eat things like yogurt to help add them to our digestive system. The microbes get food, so that's good for everybody. Coral and algae. The algae is called zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae um, photosynthesize for the coral. And the coral, again, get energy through photosynthesis from the algae. And the algae get a place to live. So everybody benefits. Turning the page, we have an example of or the definition of immensalism, where one species is harmed and the other is unaffected. You can see under my sticky note we have the hummingbird and the flower. That is mutualism. Immensalism is, is kind of an odd term. We don't see this very much. So for example, if you are on a hike and you get pricked by the thorns of a cactus and um, you get hurt, but the cactus, nothing bad or good happens to the cactus. Um, you weren't trying to eat the cactus, you weren't trying to, to hurt it, but you got harmed anyway. And so um, that would be like a mentalism. Nothing good or bad happened to the cactus, but you were harmed. This one we see more often, commensalism, where one benefits and the other is unaffected. For example, finding Nemo's a clownfish, he lives in a sea anemone. Clownfish gets protection from the sea anemone. The sea anemone has stingers on it. So the clownfish can hide in the sea anemone and get protected from predators that would want to eat the fish. The clownfish has a um, kind of a mucus all over its body that won't, so it won't get stung itself. The sea anemone does not get any good nor bad from the clownfish, so it is unaffected. And that's why we call it commensalism. The term allelio, allelopathy is a term we call when plants release poisonous chemicals to harm nearby plants. So it might be in their leaves. When the leaves fall to the ground and decompose into the soil, it might be very acidic or some other chemical. And what this prevents is other plants from germinating or living nearby. So that tree or plant can have all the water that falls from rain 
um, the nutrients in the soil and the space it needs to survive. So it prevents competition from other plants by not allowing the other plants to germinate, to sprout, to grow. On this page, we have an example of a food uh, web. And we have here different trophic levels from producers to primary consumers, secondary consumers, and then our tertiary consumers. And then we have some decomposers and detritivores, and then some detritivores and uh, decomposers on that side as well. This would be water type. This would be terrestrial or land type. All right, so a trophic level is a feeding or rank or a feeding hierarchy. Um, in this particular situation, we have one, two, three, four trophic levels. <coughs> The word detritivore is an animal that decomposes. Um, for example, worms, ants, maggots are all detritivores. They decompose, but they're physically animals. A lot of decomposers are microbes. Fungi is a microbe. Um, bacteria is a microbe and a microorganism. But if you're an actual animal that decomposes, you are a detritivore. Sometimes detritivores are called detritus feeders. You might see that on a, a, a test or an AP test. So do not be confused as to what a detritus feeder is. Detritus means dead organisms. So if you ever see a word that says, all the detritus at the bottom of the ocean, sorry, yeah, the ocean or the, <coughs> the floor of a forest, <coughs> might be dead leaves, dead branches, dead critters. It would be called detritus, so know this term as well. Another term to know is saprophytism, which is getting food from dead organic matter. So a fungus that grows on a dead branch in the forest is uh, the process called saprophytism, getting food, again, because it's dead and decaying. Page 158, we talk about biomass, trophic levels, food web, <coughs> and we have here some um, uh, food web and the different levels. I'm going to give you paper notes um, to go in your binders to explain so we can draw out a bunch of things um, concerning trophic levels and food chains and food webs. Um, so we're going to have a sticky note that says see your binder for the notes on this. So when it's time to study this concept for your exam and the AP test, you'll know to look at your drawings that we did in class together. And that is page 159. On page 160, it gives you more information about the zebra mussels and its impact on fishing communities. You don't need to know any of this for your test or the AP test. Just the zebra mussel stuff they talked about at the beginning of the chapter. So again, you do need to know about zebra mussels, just not this particular article. All right, at the bottom of 160, we talk about keystone species. And a keystone species is a very important um, uh, organism in the ecosystem. And when you remove it, it will greatly damage the ecosystem. For example, wolves in Yellowstone and sea otters in the kelp forest are both examples of keystone species. If you remove them, the ecosystem becomes unhealthy. The next page shows this. This is page 162. This is why it's called keystone, because if you take out the top piece here, the keystone of an arch, the whole arch collapses. That's where we get the term from. So you have this otter here, and otters eat urchins. When, we, um, when Russian fur traders came to California in the past, um, this is over 100 years ago, they killed off the otters for their furs. When the otters were gone, the urchin population uh, bounded. 
there were too many urchins, which then ate the holdfasts um, of this kelp. And the kelp, a lot of it um, drifted away because it wasn't anchored on the rocks anymore because this part, which is called the holdfast, was eaten. And so the kelp forest basically did not exist or do not exist without sea otters. Now, sea otters are endangered species. They're protected. So you cannot... Um, you know, harm one, kill one, hurt one, or even come close to one in the ocean. Um, it's against the law. All right, what happens when an ecosystem gets disrupted? Well, there's two things that could happen. An ecosystem that has high resistance remains stable. An ecosystem can practice resilience, which means it has some effect, but it bounces back very quickly. So an ecosystem disruption might be a fire, a flood, some logging um, in the forest, something like that. If, if, um, or, or high temperatures or low temperatures. If it remains stable, it's, it is uh, resistant to that disruption. If it's resilient, it bounces back quickly. Sometimes you have severe disruption, which triggers succession. This picture here shows secondary succession. Primary succession happens when a big disruption happens and it leaves no fertile soil, no seeds. So a volcano erupts and covers the ground in lava or um, in ash. And way under the ash, way under the lava is your fertile soil and seeds. And so it's ineffective because they can't germinate and the soil is so deeply buried that you can't, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. A glacier that's receding, this is glacier with a G, um, leaves behind bare rock without fertile soil, without seeds. The first species that comes in um, are moss and lichen. And they can grow without any nutrients. They can grow on rocks. And so that's why these are the first to come in. They die, they decompose, and then um, grasses can go in once you have a little bit of dead, decomposed matter, which turns into soil, a little bit of soil buildup, you can then have grasses. Secondary succession is at the bottom of 164. Secondary succession occurs when you actually do have fertile soil or seeds. A fire that comes through. The fire doesn't harm the seeds that are buried in the ground, and it doesn't hurt the soil. In fact, fires make soil better. Um, floods that come through, if it's a small flood. Now, if it's a large flood that causes soil erosion, then you would have primary succession. But if it's a small flood, you're going to have secondary. An abandoned farmer's field that's then going to grow wild is considered secondary succession. The top of, oh, and let's go back to secondary succession to the back here to page 163. Let me just move my sticky notes down. So we have here um, grasses, herbs, and forbs grow first in secondary succession because, again, there's fertile soil and seeds. After these die and decompose, you have enough um, buildup and enough um, nutrients in the soil for larger plants. And then after that, your larger small trees can grow, and then your large trees can grow. All right, turning back to 164. So at the bottom of 64, we have secondary succession. At the top of 164, we have um, a little more explanation about sea otters and kelp forests. <coughs> because it is the science behind the stories about otters, urchins, kelp, and a whale of a chain reaction. So sea otters eat urchins. When the otters are hunted, the urchins overpopulate and eat the kelp holdfast. Then the kelp drifts away and you have a destroyed ecosystem. Let me move this over so you can see that. First you have this one and then this one. All right, we will have another video for chapter six after this one.